Hello and welcome to the Gabakli Tabitha Stonehenge podcast. Michael Bott here. Yeah, Rupert Soskin here. And uh, yeah, uh, welcome to you. Um, this is the first in, uh, uh, I don't know how many podcasts there will be. That we've Not got. a clue how many there will be. No. We see a limitless <laughs> road uh, ahead of us. Uh, don't we? Yeah. Anyway, uh, for those of you who have not heard from us before, um, we run the uh, pre. We are the prehistory guys, Michael Bot, Rupert Soskin, and we run a YouTube channel, which you probably already know, but some of you may not. Uh, I live in Warwickshire, um, in England. Rupert lives yes. down. Where are you? Robert? I live down near uh, near the Pyrenees, and down in the south of France. Uh, yeah, in rural mm. France. You know, sometimes we very have a, rural. We have a few glitches, but not today. So yeah. far, anyway, it seems. <laughs> so, this is the very first of the uh, Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge podcasts, and I'll explain a bit more about you know why the name, why the Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge podcast series. But this being the very first one, um, we thought it would be a good idea to kick off uh, with talking about what came before uh, Gebekli Tepe. Um, so that's what we're going... I mean, we've probably bitten off more than we could possibly chew in <laughs> however long this podcast is 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 going to be. Um, in our researchers, you know... Because what we'll talk about later in just a, a moment about the basis for the Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge and the project we're on, in order to fulfil that, our prehistory focus has shifted over to the Levant and the Fertile Crescent um, <clears throat> in the years leading up to, what, about 9,500 uh, uh, BC. And our tiny minds have been a little bit blown haven't you? Would you like to expand <laughs> upon that? Would well, yeah, I think it, it, it's fair to say. Uh, it, you know, if you don't know us, uh, our history, really, our history in prehistory, is that we tended to focus on Neolithic going into the Bronze Age, and so uh, as the same as a lot of people believed that you know Gebekli Tepe is seen as this ground zero. This mm -hmm. nothing happened before that. And it's only when we started really researching deeply into that that we realised quite how profound the 10,000 years or more before Gebekli Tepe actually is. Mm. Um, a, a staggering amount of uh, human culture mm. going on. So, so whilst uh, Gebekli Tepe as a project is really about the the passage of farming as it uh, made its way west uh, across uh, across the globe, that uh, that getting into the Fertile Crescent and seeing quite how deeply people have been very comfortably exploiting their environment uh, it was a massive, massive learning curve for us and very exciting, yeah. it has to be said. So what we, we're going to be doing over the next uh, few minutes, we don't know how, we're just starting <laughs> off. We've got <laughs> uh, no real plan as to how long this podcast is going to be. But uh, absolutely, in essence, we're going to be covering the cultural and agricultural and uh, all of other kinds of shifts that it took place over those 10,000 years before... Uh, Gebekli Tepe came into existence. So, uh, tall order, wish us luck. There's loads to cover, obviously. <laughs> um, so, think of this as a, as a taste of a, a, a potpourri of, of dipping in. We don't have all the details, but we couldn't possibly, but we've picked up a bit, so we'll do our best to um, outline it for you. Yes. So, that's what's happening <clears throat> in this episode. Uh, a few words, though, about why a Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge podcast at all, though, and what we'll be doing, you know, in the following episodes, upcoming episodes. Um, those of you who know us, as we've said before, will be aware of the Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge project, which is the making of a film, a travelogue, if you like, which is going to take you 
uh, and us from Gobekli Tepe um, right through the Mediterranean, um, <clears throat> across the Black Sea, up through Greece, up the Balkans, up the Danube, um, that way round, and uh, up the Atlantic seaboard, taking how many thousands of years to explain how uh, farmer folk <laughs> originating in the Fertile Crescent <laughs> how their ancestors carried the idea and practice of farming over the you know over the millennia until we arrive at uh, megalith building in northwest europe and uh, ultimately you didn't Stonehenge. mean their ancestors at all hmm? you didn't mean their ancestors ancestors at all did you no i meant the other They're way around their descendants <laughs> yes <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've described it in a in a nutshell. There, any more to yeah. elaborate uh, there? Uh, do you know? I think it's one of the funny things that when we uh, when we explore any of these uh, ideas, that we are tracking. Technically, we're tracking the passage of how people carried farming and exploitation of the landscape. Yeah. Uh, across the world, it's it's funny how unromantic it sounds when, <laughs> when you say when you say you're follow you know we're following the farmers really yeah um, and it's true but it's it, it is fascinating how the cultural differences developed and how how much they were dependent on uh, on what the environment was like where they were yeah. it's uh, it is it's a rich tapestry and how we wouldn't be where we are now how western civilization uh, would not be mm. where it is now had not that expansion taken place so we regard it as quite a, a fundamental and a, a learning process following uh, that journey so mm. what to expect over the next <clears throat> year year and a half two years uh, maybe uh, we're already committed. In fact, as we speak now at this very moment, we're less than two weeks away for flying till we fly to Turkey uh, and arrive at uh, Gebekli Tepe at Stone at, uh, itself um, yes. to film for a few days there. And then we're going to move on to Çatal Hoyuk, Um And that'll be the first leg like, of filming uh, complete. Um, obviously, we've got a few more legs to, you know, over the coming months, whatever, how long it takes. We'll be revisiting, we'll be moving on through Europe, up the Danube, as I said, across the Mediterranean, until we get uh, get to Britain. So we reckon that's going to take us four, maybe five filming outings to uh, complete, you know, maybe maybe more with little bits of detail here and there, um, yeah. for, for which we have asked for uh, funding via our Buy Me A Coffee campaign. It's been wonderful um, so far uh, how people have responded and uh, enabled us to um, be uh, going off in a few weeks on our first leg of filming, which we're very mm -hmm. excited about and very much looking forward to. Um, so funding for that is ongoing. Uh, you can uh, have a look at uh, how you can contribute to that at a Buy Me A Coffee um, uh, website links will be in the description below and probably be a link to a promo video in the up in the corner if you're watching this on uh, on on YouTube um the other way I mean also we couldn't do any of this without uh, the, our patreon supporters we do uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, run this channel this podcast and our YouTube channel uh, on the basis of uh, uh, the support from our Patri Patreon campaign. Uh, and we have a wonderful community there, and it would be delightful if we could see you there uh, as well, if you're not already, uh, yeah. if you're not already a, a member, that is. Yes. Yeah. And if you're remotely intrigued, it's uh, also worth knowing that there's a whole load of stuff on the Patreon uh, site that is only for patrons yeah, so yeah. Uh, you know it's, it's worth being a member absolutely <laughs> so the purpose of the uh, the podcast is to kind of fill in the gaps provide support material for what we'll be doing you know in the uh, the film because obviously we'll end up what with what we'll probably output no more than you know probably 5 hours or so of video at the end and of course we'll have had to have cherry picked you know the best bits for the video we can't include everything and there's so much detail and we thought mm -hmm. well why not have a supporting podcast going along alongside and that's what uh, this is you know, just to mm. help fill in help fill in the uh, the, the gaps 
before we get on to moving on to the podcast problem, we've just been having a talk actually, and we realised, uh, cro- fingers crossed, what we'd like to do is make the next uh, Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge podcast is one that we've actually made while we're actually at G- Gebekli Tepe. How cool would mm. that be? Yes. But, uh, that yes. won't be, yeah, whether that would be, uh, uh, that'll be a few weeks away yet, so keep, keep your fingers yes. crossed. Yes, we're, we're not going to know until our feet are on the ground there <clears throat> how good the connectivity is. Yeah. If we can, we will. <laughs> but bottom line is we need your help, both in, in both ways, to support the making of Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge, the film, and to support this channel uh, and, and the podcast by becoming a, a Patreon member, whichever way works for you. We'd be very grateful indeed, and I hope to, we hope to see you around. On with the podcast proper. Wow, Mm -hmm. the 10,000 or so years before Gebekli Tepe. Mm -hmm. Now, what opened the door for us, Rupert? You know, what was the sort of gateway drug to having to, we have to, we have to put Gebekli Tepe into some kind of context. Yes. Yeah. Um, Well, it was very much, uh, I mean, all the publicity that there has been around uh, Gebekli Tepe for years now uh, about it being a ground zero, you know, that uh, that it was the first sophisticated settlements of uh, of, of humans, really. That's that's kind of... Well, it's, it's well it hasn't even been put forward as the first sophisticated settlement. It was being put forward as ground zero as the, the first temple. That, the first temple, yeah. yes. Um, and uh, uh, And it was put forward that it was only a sacred site yeah. there was nothing domestic about it uh, people weren't living there um uh yeah i mean i think that's why isn't it that uh, one of the things that's bugged us really is that uh, the what tends to happen <clears throat> is that uh, the media give you information you read the exciting news or you hear the exciting news and uh, and then when things are less exciting then the media doesn't follow up on it. So, so you know, unless you are actively looking for the latest archaeological reports or whatever, then you don't hear any of the developments that are coming out. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so uh, for example, I mean, the, the fact that one of the things about Gebekli Tepe that, uh, that made it seem even more enigmatic was that very early interpretations of the site was that it was deliberately buried. Um, and people have made, you know, big claims about what this must mean, you know, spiritually or whatever, what this must mean. But the subsequent excavations have shown that, no, that was a wrong interpretation, that this was gradual slumping over thousands of years, that the the, the hill just sloped, that slumped over the years and covered the site. So it wasn't deliberately buried at all. But most people still have that in their heads yeah. as what happened. So, you know, uh, so we started off, the whole idea of this was to really get to the reality of Gebekli Tepe and give people the latest up-to-date information. Um, uh, Lee Clare, the, uh, one of the um, head archaeologists uh, over there, is uh, a friend of ours who uh, we, we interviewed him on uh, one of our shows actually a while ago, and he was giving us a lot more information that's come out in more recent years. And, of course, a lot has happened since then. So that's what kicked us off. And it was in researching that that we found out quite how much there was that nobody ever talks about. Sites that have been known about for decades. Yeah. Decades. In the literature. Nobody talks about them. Yeah. Um, They don't uh, get talked about in the media much. mm. Uh, And uh, not that much on YouTube, although there are a few valiant folk. Mm. That, uh, that do fly the yes. flag and, and tell <clears throat> a pretty good story mm. about uh, um, yeah. the dates before uh, Gebekli Tepe. One of the sticking points uh, that people have about uh, Gebekli Tepe, uh, and I, I think it's a good leverage and, and segue into talking about the culture before Gebekli Tepe. One of the sticking points about Gebekli Tepe, and, and many people we know from comments in videos that we've made previously about Gebekli Tepe, is they can't get over this fact that um, Gebekli Tepe is described as 
a hunter-gatherer site, i.e. it was created by people who were, mm. in inverted commas, uh, hunter-gatherers. And the thing doesn't stick because um, people's idea of hunter-gatherers is that they're nomadic people. And I think this was kind of reinforced by the idea that Gobekli Tepe was a, a temple that was returned to. It was mm -hmm. never a, a settlement site, that it was a temple there out on on the hillside, up the hill, um, you know, in, in the pla plains, otherwise in the plains, that people returned to, um, you know, at certain points of the year. So that idea fit in with the idea of a nomadic people. But mm. the point is, no, we're not actually talking about uh, nomads. We're talking about people that had adopted a sedentary way of life for a very long time. And yet the term hunter-gatherer is, is not inaccurate. It's just slightly misleading. <clears throat> uh, yeah. And I think that's what's uh, looking for the truth mm. of that has taken us mm. back well, let's 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 really jump back to the to the beginnings right now, shall mm. we? And mention the site by the banks of the uh, Sea of Galilee uh, in yes. northern Israel that yeah. has the earliest evidence of people settling down. Go, Rupert. Tell yes. us. Yeah. Uh, well, Ohalo too. Yeah. Uh, it's twenty two thousand years old. I'll say that again. It's twenty two thousand years old. Um, and it was discovered in 1989 when uh, weather conditions were the Sea of Galilee had dried to such a low level that uh, uh, that it was spotted there. And Ohalo too is it's only a small settlement of oval shaped houses, but basically because of the waterlogged conditions. The level of preservation yeah. of the remains. Oh, and the fact that staggering. it had been, and the fact that it had been burnt as well. The combination of That's the fact true that too. the houses yeah. had been burnt, so they were carbonized mm. and then, uh, in a, a buried, submerged, actually preserved, mm. miraculously preserved. Mm. I don't think you're going to find many other Ahalu Two like sites um, preserved. No. Uh, so an organic, and the important no. thing is the organic material was preserved. So yes, yeah. yes, uh, and uh, and in fact, it's the organic, uh, it's the plant uh, remains that have been so uh, staggering mm. because uh, literally they uh, they excavated thousands upon thousands of seeds, fruits and seeds uh, from this site and what they could tell from that was that these people were exploiting over a hundred different species of uh of plant uh plant types yeah um now that in itself uh you know if you have a people who have created you can you can see you can imagine it anywhere that uh you, you that you've just found this place that is uh, that it's by a river or it's by the banks of, you know, wherever. You can fish here. You can live peacefully here. Uh, it's a beautiful place. Why do you want to keep moving around when this is a lovely place to be? Particularly if you can settle here and then just by walking around where you live, harvest huge amounts of uh, of food mm. that you can then store. Yeah. It's uh, it, 22,000 years old. So... The fact uh, the, and the giveaway at Aha the the other giveaway at Ahala too was a presence of <coughs> grinding tools, yes, uh, your querns, your, your pestle and, and mortars and other uh, grinding implements, which is the dead giveaway that people are gathering seeds, mm. not only but for the consumption of what in whatever form we're not quite sure whether there were. Uh, doing sorts of uh, of breads or porridges, um, but the fact is they were being made out of grains um, that they were gathering from the local wild, um, uh, you know, uh, areas in which what the what are we talking? Uh, primitive wheats and acorns and emmers and and thing, things like that. I think yeah, also. Well, I think sorry, Rupert. Go on. No, it's all right. I was just going to say, I, I think you only need to think in terms of wild grasses, yeah, really. That, yeah. um, uh, you know, that's. And, but, that, but that they were able to settle, to be sedentary, 
and subsist out of this combination of uh, wheats and and uh, and grasses, and of course doing the hunting thing as well. It's a really good note because we're talking about a period called the Epipaleolithic. It's not a term you mm-hmm. often hear when talking about prehistory uh, in in Europe, but Epi- the Epipaleolithic period is something that's used particularly uh, in the in the Middle East in the Fertile Crescent Mesop- Mesopotamia, and the reason is that. Particularly at this time, and it seems beginning round about, uh, and we're talking about the middle of a glacial maximum for the rest of the world here. So oddly, in this part of the world, um, uh, the landscape was less arid and more fertile. So we're talking about a wooded areas, you know, with uh, a variety of, of landscapes to exploit. And it, but it mm. also seemed, if we were in Europe, we'd be still be talking about the Mesolithic. So the two kind of overlap. But the, the distinguishing mm. feature in the Middle East seems to be the adoption of smaller bladelet-based um, uh, uh, weaponry for the hunting of smaller animals, for the hunting of um, rabbit, hare, fox, whatever, fish indeed. Mm. So that uh, in this period, we see the first beginnings of the adoption of a broad-spectrum diet where people Mm. are feeling they've got enough in their immediate environment to, as I was saying earlier, to satisfy their needs, no need to go walk about following the herds Mm. in order to survive. We can stay in one place. It's it's also a a good uh, point to reinforce there that the archaeology at Oahalo 2 has shown that people lived there all year round. Yeah. And... Uh, and that's one of the most significant things for me, anyway. Is one of the most significant things here that uh, that it, it completely underscores the fact that these people were happily sedentary by this point. Um, but but you know, picking up on what you were just saying about bladelets, I think it's interesting that uh, uh, Karane Four, or which is uh, a little bit later, mm. uh, that dates to between 21,000 and 18,500 years ago, uh, where they found uh, traces of stone foundations for round huts. It's interesting yeah. that we'd call them hut circles. In, yeah, in yeah, Britain, we'd right. call them hut yeah. circles. Yeah. Um, but the interesting thing there is that this site, which was, you know, it was a fair size, really. It was, um, you know, over two hectares um, uh, in size. So you're talking about, you know, five and a half acres roughly and what they found what archaeologists found there was literally millions millions of discarded flints oh yeah um and uh, (laughs) that uh, yeah i mean if you've got that many flints then clearly this is something that uh you know people have got um their hunting practices and their working practices that you know they've really got them sorted out by this point haven't they yeah it's it's kind it's kind of worth pointing out that obviously there aren't that many sites that are that are mentioned up until now. I mean, we're basing, you know, um, our words about you know shooting back to twenty thousand years BC around Ahalo too, and there's only a few more sites as we come forward two thousand years as, as we as we have to carry on for uh, come forward, you know. 2,000 years or so. We're still talking about basing all this on very few sites. Mm. Um, And it's an interesting little sidebar to mention how archaeologists, not um, how is it that archaeologists choose the sites that they're going to uh, excavate, you know, and how many of all the possible sites are there available for us to uh, excavate and create these stories out of to, to create uh, the the hypotheses that we have about how people were living. We sort of take for granted that uh, uh, the finding of a site is definitive, and yet it may not mm. be the one to tell us the true story. You know, it's mm. it's the others that we're missing at the same time. Mm. That said, 
there are an awful, awful lot of sites that have been excavated, but there are sort of your usual suspects when it comes to the, the evolution of um, farming or uh, agricultural gathering practices as we go through these mm. few thousand years that keep uh, popping up and, uh, you know, for, forgive us for sort of name dropping as we as we go <laughs> go through you know um, what is well Karana Hadira four uh, Nahal Hadira five uh, Aingev I think that's about in the same uh, ballpark we've already done the uh, Ohala two uh, we've got El Wadi uh, Tel Abu Huraira uh, Tel Sultan that's a big one um, uh, Ainan uh, the list will will keep coming. So there's a lot more yeah. to all um, the the that backs up all this progression that we know about uh, through these times uh, than you may think. Mm. And the complete list of excavated sites is really quite extensive. That said, yes. it tends to be concentrated over in the Levant, i.e., present day Israel uh, and uh, Israel, Jordan, Syria. Yeah, uh, yeah. that's right. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a lot more archaeology goes on on that side. While we're mentioning uh, Ahala too and these earlier sites, it's worthwhile just going over further a bit o over to the east a bit more to the Iran Iraq b borders because there has been some archaeology uh, uh, going on there as well. And uh, uh, in the Zagros Mountains, there are contempor sites contemporary with these others, which are over. Uh, in the uh, in the Levant more, um, the the Zazian culture also shows signs of sedentism uh, and getting control of their environment um, in the the plains around the uh, Zagros Mountains. Uh, but we've mm. done less of a deep dive, I think, uh, on that. But it's it's just worthwhile keeping in mind it wasn't confined to uh, the Levant over the other side between the Tigris and yeah. the Euphrates, and that uh, yeah. that area was also. Uh, co coming, you know, uh, coming into focus and 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 coming to life as far as managing the environment it, it, is concerned. I think it's also worth um, making the point, really, that uh, that there are so many concepts uh, about prehistory that uh, they're rooted in very old archaeology. So, you know, if you go back a century or more, when uh, obviously the discoveries that have been made, you know, significantly less, we didn't have the technology to interpret them in the same way. Our understanding, our, our understanding of uh, how people lived, how indigenous people lived the world over, that it made sense to interpret these cultures as nomadic hunter-gatherers like the Australian Aborigines. You know, we know how they live. Um, and so that made sense. Um, it's, it's only in much more recent times that, uh, that this understanding of, uh, of, of people adopting a sedentary lifestyle uh, has, ha, has really uh, become established, this uh, knowledge and understanding. And, of course, that doesn't filter through uh, so much into a more global domain because it's not a period of history that gets discussed very much at all. Um, there is, there are that's... plenty of um, uh, archaeological papers, academic papers, um, if you care to, you know, really look quite hard. Mm. They haven't been, they haven't very often been synthesised and gathered together uh, in one place. Uh, nobody seems to have really taken on that responsibility. Um, mm. it, you have to hunt about a bit. I can't think of any one book that deals with the period that we're talking about now, although it is such an important period. There is mm. one guy I would hope could take up that uh, uh uh, that task, and that's uh, uh, Trevor Watkins, that Trev yeah, yes. who's done such a lot of work in this area and excavated such a lot. And uh, he seems, mm. I, I think, uh, of everybody that's alive now, he seems to be the uh, major uh, authority, particularly on the period. And uh, yeah, we can only wish for you know that one day uh, a book is is published. In the meantime, <laughs> stuff is piecemeal. As I said earlier, yes. though, if you look around. On YouTube, there are a few brave souls that have gone there, um, you know, uh, uh, and make really great efforts. Not always accurate, mm. uh, 
um, but have made attempts at, at synthesizing the, the story. Mm. Before we leave, um, Karaheni 4, it's worthwhile I've, mentioning. I've got something else I want to say. Yes, go on. Uh, yeah, were you going to mention yeah. shells? I was going to mention shells. That's exactly what I was going to mention. <laughs> <laughs> go on, you go first then. Well, I mean, isn't it one of the first instances of people, you know, uh, evidence of people wearing decorative jewellery? Uh, indeed. And uh, uh, and I, I wasn't, uh, to be honest, thinking so much of the fact that they were wearing it. As they it's the fact obtained that, it in the first place, yeah. Uh, it's the fact that uh, they found uh, marine shells at, uh, at Karane 4, uh, uh, bearing in mind, just uh, to say again, that we're talking about a site that's uh, you know, between, say, 18 and 21,000 years old. And these shells, some of them came from the Mediterranean, some of them came from the Red Sea. Yeah. And you're talking about the nearest. that's 125 uh, miles away is the nearest and 250 miles away uh, the Red Sea. Now, yeah. How they uh, how they acquired those, how they came to be there. Obviously, there's all sorts of theories. They it could have been exchanged between people. We people, we, we know that people have been uh, uh, interconnecting over huge distances for a long time. So maybe they were trading them. Maybe they were just swapping them. Maybe they travelled the distance and picked them up themselves. The point yeah. is that people were travelling. Yeah. Uh, that's well, the point is major. that people were probably networking as well. I mean, like you say, yeah. exchanging that, uh, of course, yeah. implies th these, uh, um, you know, n not uh, settlements in isolation. Mm -hmm. mm. That, um, uh, yeah, people were doing that thing, <laughs> where, they, where yeah. they'd actually begun trade. I mean, and also in the in the with the purpose of looking good as well. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. 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 I mean, this yeah. goes back way, yeah. way, way. I mean, this is not an isolated instance, well, but it's the fact that, you know, we've got evidence of distance cover mm. in order to look good. That's something. I, 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 that's, that's true. I think it's worth, um, uh, uh, and th this, this really is uh, going off on a tangent, but it's worth saying that we have seen some pretty stunning Denisovan uh, jewelry. Oh, There's yeah. one particular greenstone bracelet. It's broken, but this beautifully, highly polished uh, bracelet, and that's what I think that's thirty six thousand years old. So humans have been doing their damnedest to look cool <laughs> for a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> mm. um, also, they're still uh, hunting a gazelle a lot, uh, aurochs. Mm. Um, so large game is still. In the uh, still in the diet, mm. <coughs> so we're talking about a sort of interim stage here between maybe Ohala to going back to uh, twenty two thousand years ago. But mm. now we're, we've sort of filled the gap between that and something we really know about. Well, we don't really know about. I'm talking about the royal we, the <laughs> the, <laughs> the uh, yes, uh, academic um, con contingent, uh, really know, begin to know stuff. And that's when we talk about uh, the Natufians. When did we mm. when did we first start talking about the Natufians? Because I we think it's first relevant. started talking about the Natufians. Oh, it was a few years ago mm. that uh, there was a, a discovery made um, uh, at a site where, <laughs> well, the uh, the article talked about the earliest known toast, <laughs> uh, which is fourteen and a half thousand years old, and. Uh, uh, that just tickled your imagination, well, didn't it? It really did, <laughs> really did. And it was a Natufian site. And I've got to be honest, uh, you know, prior to that, I didn't really know. I'd heard the name, but I didn't know about the Natufians. Um, and it's it's fascinating when you start looking at uh, Natufian sites generally uh, that, uh, you know, again, these are a people who had uh, life pretty sorted out. Yeah. I mean, obviously uh, they didn't spring out of sites, nowhere, so. but again, we're we're sort of leaping forward mm. a few another few thousand years. I mean, the Natufians, on the timeline, they appear what thirteen thousand BC thereabouts. BC, yeah. So you're talking about between fifteen thousand and eleven and a half thousand years ago. Yeah, 
Uh, and if you want to find out more about them, um, uh, I think one of the major sites that has really, um, apart from when Dorothy Garrett, who was the archaeologist uh, that, that, that first um, named uh, the, mm. the culture itself, um, I think the first instance of it, well, uh, Natufian, they must be named for... No- uh, well, it's 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 the the valley. It's the is oh. it the Natu Valley, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I should know that. Um, which I think it was um, I think it was a I, cave I, site that which she was uh, excavating. Yes, it's mainly. the Albaker Cave. Is that the one? Yeah, I think that makes uh, that makes sense. It's probably an appalling tra- <laughs> uh, pronunciation, <laughs> but but hey, I'm good at that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm. But here we have uh, evidence, uh, you know, in. Not in every case, uh, obviously, but particularly at the site of uh, Onan, um, which is uh, where that's that's definitely uh, is that still northern? Are we still in Israel? We're above. Uh, we're quite near the Mediterranean again, uh, northern Israel, uh, I do believe. Mm-hmm. But we're talking about a cave site. Now, um, I need to really, really qualify that because the the way that the Natufians are distinguishing this cave site is not only the occupying the cave from you know from god knows how long ago but no they're settled in this cave <laughs> they're not it's mm. not uh, seasonal or anything like that they're creating terraced landscapes around about the caves they're making buildings they're using stone to form um, uh, buildings around the, the cave entrance and actually mm. inhabiting quite a, a large area around this cave. So we've got a sense of people really, again, really, really in control of their environment. And it wasn't so many mm. weeks ago that we did a piece about, remember the Natufian flute? Indeed. Yeah, um, that's where this f- was uh, found. Uh, not a flute, we think, but a, a sort of bird caller thing made out of a a, a duck's uh, leg, but it's got holes bored into it so that it makes the sound yes. of a raptor. Yes. So we've got in our imaginations uh, these <laughs> people who are regularly hunting around a sort of marsh area with, with lakes and so on and so forth, um, uh, hunting small game, um, rap- reptiles maybe, and birds and ducks themselves. So uh, uh, I'll, no, I'll save that for a little while longer. I was going to mention <laughs> another animal that we haven't quite mentioned yet as part of major part of the diet. Oh, I know where you're going. Uh, yeah, yes. abs- absolutely. So I'll just reiterate again um, this idea mm. of a broad spectrum diet that enables people to stay in one place. One aspect we mm. haven't mentioned that's important that when when you start living off uh, seeds and and uh, and, uh, and uh, cereals, and that's the idea of storage. And I think it's at these Natufian sites that we begin mm. to get a glimpse of people for the first that really storing stuff. You know, so yeah. that they can can really live in the same place year yeah. in, yeah. Uh, year in, out. In fact, it has to be said that, uh, certainly speaking for myself, I don't know about you, Mike, but um, uh, that actually this whole thing about storage was a real bombshell for me mm-hmm. because uh, we have this, um, I say we, <laughs> I, I think we do, uh, generally have this notion that that people decided to settle down. You know, when people decided that they wanted to start farming and that's when people settled down and farming started, as opposed to it's actually entirely the other way around, that when – so these uh, sedentary people who still were not farmers, uh, that uh, a team of researchers did uh, some number crunching on this and they came up with uh, that uh, uh, one individual working hard for three weeks – could gather enough wild grain to keep a family for an entire year. Mm. Uh, now, if you if you think about that, that uh, that you you have this period uh, where you know it, uh, t- towards the end of summer, or maybe in the height of summer, depending on where you are, that's when the grains that are absolute best, and that's when you want to harvest them. So you go out and you gather all this stuff. Well, you've gathered all this stuff. What are you going to do with it? You can't carry it with you. It's the need to store stuff 
that actually made people settle down yeah. because you've got tons of stuff that you now need mm. to look after. Mm. Uh, that completely changed my world view <laughs> in terms of the history of sedentism. Yeah. Yeah. Not only the pre um, production possibly, you know, because if we think about uh, wheat uh, cultivation and gathering, we automatically think about bread with mentioned bread, you know, the Natufian burnt toaster <laughs> earlier, but also mm -hmm. in one of the uh, cave sites, I think it's the uh, Rakafet cave, um, it, it, that they found, what is, which is the, the, the lower bit, the pestle or the mortar? Uh, uh, the pestle is the tool, isn't it? The pestle is the tool and the mortar is the, and that's is the, the mortar. basin or the, the, the uh, yeah, the, 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 the bowl. Pestle. Mortar, pestle, pestle. Do you know what? <laughs> no, that's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> that's actually quite shocking. Yeah. I'm sure we know that. Anyway, they found. Anyway, go on. They found, found that the 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 bowl bits uh, actually hollowed out into the you know um, into the ground uh, of this cave, in the base of the, this cave. Several of them, you know, obviously a a thing was going on, a process was going on. Um, and what uh, what they reckon is in this particular case that because of the analysis of the remnants in the bottom of these pestle or mortars, whichever they are, <laughs> um, <laughs> that they were actually uh, brewing. They were creating that. They were for the creation yes. of an early form of beer. Not very alcoholic, but alcoholic enough for uh, Robert Braidwood to suggest that beer as well as bread, or even beer more than bread, may be a, a cause or um, uh, a major factor, shall we say, in uh, the development of, of agriculture. Um, maybe um, uh, beer uh, was a causal factor. Uh, in people needing <laughs> to, uh, yeah, to grind stuff and uh, uh, and ferment stuff, um, uh, you know. And we, he sorry, hence, I, 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 I just had to check, and uh, we were right. The mortar is the bowl. Mortar is the bowl. Okay, <laughs> of course it is. It all makes sense now. Yes, um, yeah. But it was drea, was beer a driver of agriculture? That's the uh, that's what the question. Actually, a little mm. sidebar. I mentioned Robert Braidwood there. He was an American archaeologist, and he deserves um, he, he's dead dead now. But he is not a name that's mentioned that very often, and I think he deserves to be mentioned because it's him, his influence uh, and his um, analysis of climate and and uh, uh, the geography of the Fertile Crescent that he had, that it was under his uh, uh, hypotheses that a lot of the sites were pinpointed in the first place for excavation. So mm -hmm. without that man, you know, we probably wouldn't be having quite the conversation we're having now. I don't know. Um, mm, but I think, uh, yeah... Um, yeah. Look up um, Robert Braidwood. He, he deserves a lot more recognition, and I think he uh, uh, probably gets yeah. uh, for all sorts of reasons. Do you know, th something else I'd like to mention uh, while we're talking about the Natufians, yeah. uh, because uh, you know, obviously, farming and uh, and living are uh, very important. But it's uh, it's an interesting development in uh, in burial practices oh, yeah. with the Natufians yes, yes. and uh, and something that's uh, that's intriguing uh, generally is that something that's seen in Natufian burials um, is that uh, somebody was buried and then at some point afterwards the grave was reopened for them to remove the skull oh. just the skull there are lots of burials where uh, you, the the body is uh, is headless, mm -hmm. um, and they know that the skull was taken out at a later date. So it, it, there's there's nothing that we can really say about that, other than the fact that you can see that humans have had some pretty interesting 
belief systems, if you like, yeah. around uh, how to deal with the dead mm. for for a very long time. Well, it seems from uh, excavations of Natufian sites that uh, there's a, quite an acceleration, shall we say, in um, the complexity of burial practices. Uh, mm. As you know, we've mentioned before, shells seem to be a, a popular thing to decorate people, but they see, but uh, burials seem to have become more elaborate uh, um, in these times. You know, so maybe we've got the appearance, you know, first appearance of some kind of hierarchies, particularly particular people being honoured in special way in the in the way in which they're. Uh, what uh, attire they're buried in and what grave goods associate them to associate them with. Actually, while we're talking about uh, grave goods, it's worth mentioning uh, the burial at uh, Harrison uh, Taftit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, go on. Well, yes, um, the burial, this is a, a Natufian burial, it seems. Um, I can't remember where exactly. I think it's more southern Israel, this one. Uh, Halas and Taxit, uh, the, there was a burial of a 45-year-old woman um, who, amongst uh, amongst other things, was buried. Let me look at my notes. What have we got? She was 45 years old. She was buried with 50 tortoise shells, two skulls of uh, two pine marten, a single human foot, bones from boar and leopard, and aurochs, amongst uh, amongst other things, so go figure that one. <laughs> now I mentioned the fifty tortoise mm. first in that, and I, I, if you've never not heard of this before, you think, well, go, fifty tortoise. What is that about? That that sounds like an awful yeah. lot of work to put, you know, fifty tortoise uh, in with uh, a burial. But not so fast, because these folks were eating a heck of a lot of tortoise. So finding yes. 50 shells yes. was... I think, I have to say, I think it's utterly shameful that you said not so fast. But, <laughs> but, but, um, um, but, um, but yes, yeah. Do you know, I, this is a complete aside, but I think it is worth telling the story that uh, that uh, when uh, when there were all the expeditions over to the Galapagos Islands, Charles Darwin oh, yeah. and, and all the subsequent expeditions, uh, and the giant tortoises of the Galapagos Islands, and uh, the idea for a long time was to um, uh, was to uh, bring some back to put in zoos. But uh, but they never made it home because even when they put some on board to bring home to put in zoos, they just tasted so good <laughs> that they never made it. Yeah. They just you can obviously that you can imagine that was the last tortoise on a ship, and they're going, oh, go on, just cook it. Um, yeah. People obviously, I I don't know what does a tortoise taste like, but obviously they taste very good. And interesting that if she was buried with that many yeah. shells, uh. It it also raises the question: How long have people been using tortoise shell as a mm. uh, you know a jewellery item as well? You know, yeah. um, it also I mean, she was buried with the shells rather than yeah. artifacts. But uh, interesting. Here's mm. a cheeky thought about tortoise, and I'd I'd like some you know anybody's input on, on this. Is um, hunting tortoise probably not that hard? Uh, you know, so easy, in fact, that you'd probably run out very fast unless you were managing that population, that uh, uh, resource as well. And I'm thinking, ooh, were they farming t tortoise? Were they, did, mm. was the, had, in my mind, it would become very easy to domesticate the tortoise. I don't know how, mm. I mean, I think they breed pretty, pretty slowly. So, uh, they also grow quite slowly. They also grow quite slowly, so I don't know quite how that would work. I'm, I'm just, I'm just thinking as a tortoise farming as a pre precursor to, the yes, <laughs> yes, for the domestication so, of it, larger animals in the future. But, but you know, it, it, again, yeah. and it begs another question though that she was buried with that many tortoise yeah. shells, and uh, and and I have to wonder just because I can't think of anywhere in the world today 
where you see tortoises in large quantities. Turtles, yes. Tortoises, no. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, even in the wilds of jungles, you know, I've only ever come across one at a time. Mm. Um, uh, so it makes you wonder, you know, have we completely destroyed tortoise populations as well? I wonder. Uh, that's another mm. matter. It is indeed. I think the fact is, you know, we've covered a lot of time already. Uh, uh, the, yes. the chronology is, uh, if we bring ourselves forward up, up to about 11,000 BC, uh, just after, mm. uh, we have to start mentioning uh, the younger Dryas. Yeah, indeed. Um, and the, the fact that, you know, the climate changed quite drastically. Um, mm. Not only over all, all over the world, but uh, in the area we're talking about here as well. And it seems, mm. although um, uh, the Natufian culture seems to have survived uh, this period, that w for all that we've been talking about people settling down, that as the climate did become colder and in this area mm. became more arid, that people w were forced to, to become a bit more nomadic again, less settled uh, during mm. this time. And mm. in case you think, you know, we think we, we, so far we're thinking about all oh, a progression of, of agriculture and people managing their, their things and, and just hinting at uh, people cultivating stuff. The, they were at the mercy of the climate and to a large degree, mm. you know, our very civilization, um, because it's not a given that uh, the younger dryers and such climate. Uh, fluctuations uh, are not going to put paid completely uh, to you know things that have been developing over over millennia in, in yeah, terms of yeah, our ability to manage the our resources. Yeah. So it's an interesting point. Mm -hmm. You 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 mentioned Abu Huraira uh, before, yeah. and uh, Abu Huraira is a, is a good example of that. Where, as the weather conditions uh, changed, they uh, they tried to uh, to cultivate more wild rye, which is a hardier crop and can yes. deal with colder uh, conditions. Uh, but it was it still didn't work. The site was still abandoned. Um, yeah. Uh, Abu Huraira is up in the uh, in northern Syria. In northern Syria, yeah. yeah, yeah. And the site itself is actually yeah. now uh, underwater, uh, uh, under mm. a, a, a man-made lake. Uh, reservoir, uh, I think. Um, uh, Do you yeah. know what? Actually, before before we move on from that, uh, uh, just while I think about it with Abu Huraira, also worth uh, pointing out there that uh, the interpretation of the archaeological remains there is that they think that Abu Huraira in its um, uh, in its later stages was home for around uh, well for thousands of people certainly. Yeah. Um, and uh, and th that's an important thing to get in your head, really. The fact that we're not talking about small settlements yeah. of uh, of a hundred people, we're talking about you know real villages of thousands of people. Yeah. It's uh, you know it's a different thing to have in your head. Mm -hmm. But we're but we're despite the fact it seems that some people were becoming less sedentary and had become m more mobile. It seems mm. that uh, the idea of building it seems to have actually taken hold. Uh, I know people have been building buildings and making, you know, uh, using stone to build stone-based based houses and, and so on and so forth before, but now uh, mm. it begins to start to take hold. I mean, towards the end of the Younger Dryas, and we're talking about, if we're talking about the end of the Younger Dryas, we're also talking about the end of the Epipaleolithic period and just coming into the beginnings of, um, dare I say it, the pre-pottery Neolithic. Mm. Um, we could do a, uh, do a whole number on the definition of Neolithic, <clears throat> but let's just stick with the definitions uh, as, yes. as we've not, got. Not them. today. Not, not today. <laughs> um <laughs> yeah, because uh, Neolithic means many different things depending uh, where in the world you are. And uh, mm. so, you know, hopefully as we go on, you get used to the idea of being Neolithic being different wherever, where you are in the world. Here we've got the yeah. pre-pottery Neolithic or the A-ceramic 
uh, ne- Neolithic, meaning they hadn't invented pottery yet, amazingly. Yes. Um, so. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I, I must admit that there are aspects of that that I, I think obviously archaeologists are uh, constrained to uh, in, interpret uh, what's found. But, uh, but you know, I, I can think of all sorts of uh, instances where, um, you know, you, you can make yourself a cup out of tree bark. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, people make cups out of leaves and what have you. So, uh, you know, it might be that, yes, it's certainly pre-pottery, um, but, um, but they, they probably had all sorts of sophisticated drinking vessels that just haven't lasted in the, the archaeological record. Yeah. Um, I wonder what they were. But we've got all sorts of examples around about this time period, say, you know, 10,000 BC, 12,000 years ago. Uh, that in in mm. that area, they're really starting to get handled, the idea of building permanent settlements out of stone. And we mm. begin to see the idea of special buildings uh, within those uh, settlements. And these special buildings <clears throat> seem to be some, some uh, to do with something that we've already been talking about, and that is storage. That uh, the storage area in so many of these uh, buildings, uh, settlements, uh, seem to be at the, the centre of the, the settlement, and quite elaborate too, seem to be devoted to the storage um, of, uh, uh, of of wheat and uh, all those uh, consumables. Um, one, uh, what is it? Jefel Ahmad, I think, is a probably um, uh, an exemplar uh, of that. So we've got what looks like a circular special building in the middle. But you've also got indications that it may have been treated specially as well because of the activities there. Is it not Jeff al Ahmar where um, there's a, as a human body was found in the middle of this area, which... Uh, uh, oh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, and other indications, maybe, of um, some kind of ritual stuff going on in these central... Uh, buildings which are also serving this uh, storage uh, thing. So what essentially we've got is circular buildings for uh, silo storage uh, surrounded by square uh, hab- inhabited buildings, certainly square buildings that were perhaps devoted to the processing of the grain um, that has been stored in those uh, mm. silos. Um, mm. uh, yeah, Jeff El Ahmar is a, a good place as a reference for that. Um, but now we're really coming up to, you know, the beginning of the pre-pottery Neolithic, as I, as I said, and I don't think we can dwell any more on the developments of, um, you know, agriculture as we've just done for the past what eight thousand years of, of mm. development without beginning <clears throat> to mention the uh, the Tash Tepla sites mm. and the sites in mm. um, southeastern Turkey. Uh, the epitome of which is, of course, Gubekli Tepe itself. Mm. Mm. Uh, uh, well, yeah, absolutely. I think you know the p- a point obviously uh, been made that uh, that people have been living very comfortably in their environment for a long time. So to get to the point where these sites are so settled and sophisticated. Uh, you, you can't look at a site like Beckley Tepe without uh, appreciating that that site has developed over a long period of time. Uh, yeah. You know, there must have been people. Or well, the the uh, ideas uh, you, that you see epitomised at Beckley Tepe have been in development uh, for quite some some time. We we haven't mm-hmm. mentioned uh, Tel as Sultan or other otherwise perhaps known as Jericho. Well, uh, I don't know <clears throat> if Tele Sultan, you know, is the uh, Jericho, the basis of, of Jericho uh, itself. But that's a very old site. And got uh, the first built tower. Yes. That's a wonderful, um, yeah, stone built uh, tower there, which uh, predates Gebekli Tepe. But yes. fascinatingly, in the whole, well, how many sites are there now in the whole of the uh, Tash Tepla project, which is the Turkish project to um, uh, do archaeology 
on majorly the, the what are called the T-pillar sites. You know, it began with Gebekli Tepe yeah. uh, and has been developing with Karan Tepe and so many other te- uh, Tepe sites that are developing this style of, uh, of T-pillar and, and other things. And <clears throat> that project has uncovered more and more. So, in fact, we have uncovered, it seems uncovered relatively recently, uh, is a site called uh, Chatol, uh, I beg its pardon, uh, Chakmak Tepe, um, which uh, predates Gebekli Tepe by quite some time, um, but it is reckoned to be a precursor, uh, because although it has circular um, special buildings in the middle. It seems that those were constructed of wood. So uh, instead of uh, stone pillars or T pillars, this earlier site um, seems to show uh, a, a progenitor of that, a precursor of, uh, of that kind of support, only that the supports were timber posts set in the rock in uh, hollowed out um, uh, um, post holes to support a roof, because uh, that's mm. what we're talking about, uh, I- inevitably. And Rupert, I mean, in about four weeks' time, fingers crossed, we will um, be at Chakmak Tepe. So we'll be able to see for ourselves, Indeed. you know, this what, how they were supporting roofs above the special buildings uh, originally, you know, before yeah. uh, uh, a couple of hundred years later, we've got uh, Gobekla Tepe and the other yeah. um, Tastepla yeah. sites, Tastepla sites. Yes. Yes, it's it, it's remarkable I think when you I mean another aspect of um <clears throat> if this isn't leaping forwards too much but another aspect of uh, Gobekli Tepe that um has become quite remarkable uh, is the that they have found thousands upon thousands of grinding stones there, yeah. quartz stones thousands of them. Now they're not broken, so uh, so it, it wasn't like it was necessary that if this one's broken, we need to make a new one. <laughs> there are thousands of them. You know, how much grain were these people actually processing yeah. uh, and on what scale? Yeah. Uh, that is remarkable. Uh, and when you look at uh, one of the other sites, Bonchuklutala, for example, the field of beads that... Which also uh, predates excavations Gebekli Tepe by, by quite a margin. Also predates yeah. Gebekli Tepe by quite a while. And uh, and the things that they have found, countless thousands of beads, and they've only excavated a tiny percentage of the site. So mm. if you're making beads on that almost industrial scale, well, what's that about? Mm. Uh, you know, clearly uh, life is pretty sorted if you're doing fancy stuff rather than... Um, uh, rather than worrying about food, if you know, it's it's uh, it, there are so many aspects to uh, uh, to what 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 these particular types of artifacts are telling us about how established people's lifestyles actually were. I yeah. think that's the point. There is also, it seems, an artistic continuity. I'm not quite sure mm. how much Chakmak Tepe uh, predates Gobekli Tepe by. I think it's one or two hundred years. Uh, uh, at least, um, but the artistic representations, albeit on a smaller scale, on sw- small plaques or what have you, that have been found at Chakmak Tepe, are the same kind of designs that we find enlarged at Gobekli Tepe and make it quite famous. Um, mm. th- th- those representations of, of animals that they knew day in, uh, day out. Uh, present at a smaller scale and represented in the very similar style uh, at Chakmak Tepe uh, and uh, uh, obviously uh, in the way we know so well at uh, Gobekli Tepe later. So there's this uh, artistic continuity uh, as as well. Mm. Mm. I'm just going to mention this as a sidebar, Rupert. I mean, we haven't mentioned, you, you know, so we've, we've come to Gobekli Tepe and we know that they had not domestic they were not uh, uh domesticated farmers in the way that we understand it you know they were not herding cattle yet in fact they were uh, uh, over hunting gazelle as far as we can uh, m- make out mm. that's a fascinating aspect of the process and probably this has something to do with the the, the younger dryas 
and uh, human beings as they do uh, pushing things to the extreme. There's a huge shift from the hunting of smaller animals to, it seems like, an almost industrial scale hunting of gazelle. I'm just wondering, yeah. this is a conjecture, I'm not asserting this, but I, I'm asking the question. At the same time as a roundabout, we've got these larger settled sites developing, you know, using the local material. Here's another thing. Availability of local materials is an important aspect mm. of what, why we find these sites here. But, con mm. uh, but uh, contemporaneously with the development of these, we've got the appearance of what are known as desert kites in the, the landscape. Uh, desert kites. Uh, you describe a, a desert kite, uh, Rupert. Well, they're called kites because that's the shape that they are, these sort of uh, um, diamond shapes almost, or kite shapes. But um, but they were um, they were for corralling animals. They were these are these are hunting uh, structures. Yeah. Of, or for funneling uh, uh, traveling walls. herds into yeah. narrower and narrower gaps, so that mm. you know they could be uh, managed mm. in some way or picked off, you know, with, with uh, greater efficiency. Um, mm. but the the numbers in which gazelle were being consumed shoots up in the in this period that the 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 amount of smaller mammals and uh, smaller fauna being consumed goes way down disappears off this off the graph and the gazelle shoot up and I I do mm. wonder that you know this the use of the desert kites it kind of industrialized hunting. And enabled, you know, the the settlement of these larger sites in some way, or mm. contributed to it in in some way. It, it's certainly not an unreasonable idea. I mean, it dropped off r rapidly as well, because I suspect this, you know, increased efficiency that it gave them um, actually caused overhunting uh, over time. So that end of it may have collapsed. I don't know. Mm. So as promised, here we are at uh, Gebekli Tepe. We've got lots more to say about Gebekli Tepe itself, and hopefully in the next podcast we will be saying lots more about it from the actual site itself, if not that, at yes. least after having been there in person. Um, so mm. uh, th there's probably quite a few shockers <laughs> for many people about what Gebekli Tepe really is from the fact that it was a, a settlement site, a domesticated site. And dare we yes. say, there is a question mark over uh, being dogmatic about uh, the use of the special area in, in the middle, which, you know, is beautifully decorated, or the special buildings, the several special buildings, um, being dogmatic about their use as um, ritual centres. Um, mm. You know, that jury is still out and there's a lot to discuss uh, about that. There's a huge amount to discuss about that. And uh, yes, we, we won't start that one now because, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, um, because it's a, it's a big conversation yeah, it is. It, in itself. As yeah. is the conversation about hierarchical structures. Do these larger settlements, you know, the, the, uh, as they uh, as we've moved into from the Younger Dryas and we've used, moved from the upper Paleolithic, uh, into pre -po the uh, pre pottedly Neolithic A <laughs> and these large larger sites. Does that bring into question, you know, the questions of, of hierarchies and the organization of of larger communities and the necessity of that? Is that an emergent property uh, of uh, groups of people once they become above a certain number? Mm. So many more We've skimmed across the surface of this whole uh, subject. Uh, yes. I, I hope, you know, you found that interesting. We've got so much more to talk about as far as Gebekli Tepe to concern, is concerned, and I hope that you'll stick with us as we, um, uh, over time, also fill in the gaps between Gebekli Tepe uh, and Stonehenge as we move across uh, Europe. You got anything to add to that, Rupert? <laughs> Uh, no, I think uh, just a, a, a reinforced point. There are going to be an awful lot of surprises along the way because um, <laughs> it, there's well, there's just an astonishing amount of uh, of stuff that 
is not generally known. Yeah. Um, and there are places that we'll, we'll be visiting, uh, and I can think of one place in particular in Bulgaria. Yeah. I'm just going to leave it there as a tease. Uh, but <laughs> you, in, just in your face, uh, you're <laughs> looking at so much history. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there's some fascinating things along the way. Yeah. I mean, we, we could have name-dropped site names you know, till kingdom come, <laughs> couldn't we? But, uh, but we didn't. Anyway, folks, uh, yeah. thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. I uh, hope you enjoyed that and I hope you find uh, much food for thought and we look forward to the next time and seeing you again. Till then, bye for now. We'll see. See you soon. <laughs>